Family stories get passed down from generation to generation. Details get lost and emerge from time to time. And many of those stories become forgotten. But the few that remain leave a mark. This story left a mark that never faded. It began in 1858, and I first heard it in 1989. I was given a journal by my dad, and within those pages was the story of my great, great, great grandfather William. His life, or so it seemed from his journal entries, was at a crossroads. He chose a road less traveled and began a life at sea on a massive sailboat. For 357 days, he circumnavigated the globe and would write about it. I would find myself captivated by his words and would read about his voyage under the covers before bed quite often. It only took a few journal entries to imagine what he was going through, as it often felt like he was talking to me. And from the second I read the words Cape Horn, I knew I had to see it with my own eyes. September 10th, 1858. Old Boris never showed himself more violent than today. All the rest of the passage, he was asleep until we arrived off Cape Horn. We woke up for about three weeks and then again went to sleep until this morning. When he came down upon us with a vengeance for about 20 minutes, ripping and tearing our sails at a fearful rate, when a squall arose, which did not seem threatening. So we took a no sail until it was right upon us. A heavier heart never went to board a ship. I'm doing it because of the tie. I go through my great, great, great grandfather's journal and we write the same, we speak the same. And while the details in my mind may not be exactly the same as what he went through, the version of his life that I made up in my mind at eight, well, it never left. I began my search for a boat to sail Cape Horn in 2008. On that trip to South America, I failed to get in the open water. Edge of the earth, boys and girls. But I made a friend, and it was his guidance that kept me coming back to the idea that I had to sail around Cape Horn. So I went for it. So to get to the boat that would sail around Cape Horn, we had to first fly to Ushuaia, Argentina, then hop on a small boat to get to Puerto Williams in Chile, where we would depart from. Are you going to Puerto Williams? No, no. <laughs> where did you come from? China. But on day one, there was one problem. The weather was not helping our cause. Kind of funny when you think of it. Look outside, it's raining. It's grimy. It's gray. All we want to do is be in the middle of it. In fact, high winds canceled our small boat. We got to book a flight in the next like four minutes. We want to find our way to Cape Horn. That's going to happen. But I was not going to miss this chance I had been dreaming about for 25 years and was willing to do whatever it took to get to Port Williams. And as usual, the weather won. We were landlocked. So it was back to the hostel to settle in and learn about Ushuaia for two nights. So this is Ushuaia, the city that um, I never knew it really existed. You probably don't either. But it's the most southern city in the world. It's at the very, very tip of Argentina and South America. And this is what people call the edge of the earth. You may be asking, who is this guy? Well, my name is Yogi Roth, and I'm a seeker. I've been on a search for adventure my entire life. It began as an athlete, seeking touchdowns and transformed into seeking great stories on the road, at football games, and on TV sets. I didn't know it as a kid, but traveling would become a part of my soul. We never really went anywhere as a family because we didn't have the means to travel internationally, but our parents were genius. They would bring the world to us. Each summer, I would give up my room and a foreign exchange student would move into it. So while we never went to Africa, Israel, Germany, or Asia, it, in a roundabout way, came to us. It was there, in an international home in the country town of Dalton, Pennsylvania, population 2,500, 
was where my thirst to explore began. And once I got a taste, I was hooked. It's interesting. My first time at a hostel. It's my first time being in another country completely by myself. And it's exciting, it's exhilarating, it's terrifying. But I must say that this is a cool feeling. Meet Tyler, filmmaker extraordinaire. I heard about him a few months before I was set to take off. I knew his skill set was exactly what we needed. He was young, creative, and fearless. But he also had never left the U.S. before, which ended up being the best part. First instinct was no-brainer. Let's do it. Let's go on a trip. Let's go on an adventure. Let's go see the world. Let's go do something fun. Woo. And it's weird when it sank in really what I was doing. I, I did have this kind of overwhelming fear and sensation that, you know, I've, I'm going on this trip where I'm traveling by myself to get there, which I've never done before and was a whole new experience for me and just totally has gotten me out of my shell just in the few days that, you know, we've started this trip. It's an adventure and that's probably the thing I'm most excited for. All I know is that I'm there to capture it and I'm there to help tell it. September 10th, 1858. I cannot say that I felt sorry when I left Allentown to go to Boston to join the ship. I could hardly raise my foot high enough to step over the bulwarks, and believe me, my friends, a heavier heart never went aboard a ship. What is that? You can feel it. This is for you. Yeah. Come here at 9, 9, 9.15. And go to the passenger control and go to the immigration. Okay. Okay? Can we leave our back? Yes. Okay. It's okay. All right, have it. We made it. We're going on the boat. We're going on the boat. Let's go. This is Ishwai, our, our home. It's beautiful, colorful, green, lush, snow. Home base. And then we're gonna go there. And that's just the channel to the ocean, man. I came down seven years ago to visit this region of the world, and I met a guy named Ben. And Ben is from Southern California, met an Argentine woman, started a family, started a, a new life down here, and he's a seaman. And he started sailing around Cape Horn. And I remember one night I was at his place, and I said, do you think that you're born to sail Cape Horn? And I swear, he stares right back at me. For maybe the first time, he looked me directly in the eye. He said, Yogi, my son, you were born to sail Cape Horn. I think a big part of this trip is fulfilling something I set out to do at eight, but also hopefully providing some sort of nudge, push, tap to somebody out there who's trying to live their life without limits. We're about to get our way over to Puerto Williams, where our boat awaits. So about a three, three and a half hour journey by uh, boat, by bus, almost there. Oh, and by the way, probably gonna be wearing the same thing every day, so the way you can know it's a different day, it's gonna be by this guy. She's <laughs> filling in, nice. So we hopped on a small boat, almost like a hovercraft, and away we went, across the Beagle Channel. It was exciting, as this seemed to be the most difficult step on this trip, and most uncertain. But we were one step closer to sailing around Cape Horn. We're here. Yes, Tyler was right. We were here. But here was also exactly where I walked in 2008, and nothing changed. I couldn't believe it. It was as though time stood still. For the past seven years, this town remained the same. The roads, the stores, even the crisp cold. Above all that was the feat that remained on the forefront of my mind, and I couldn't help but think about the year 1858. I wonder if my great, great, great grandfather had walked down the same road. When I was in New York, and found my purse reduced to that low ebb that it was scarcely sufficient to defray my expenses another week, and every effort of gaining a livelihood ashore was frustrated. I had but one alternative, and that was the sea. 
and before we walked onto our boat to attempt this dream of mine, I remembered what Ben told me about what it takes to sail the most dangerous sea on Earth. To be able to sail around the cage uh, takes uh, a person that has a lot of um, self-confidence and also has, uh, has to be uh, somewhat uh, on the brave side. They can't be cowards. Um, everybody that I've ever met that's gone around there that uh, really enjoyed it were valiant souls. I recall reading an excerpt from my great, great, great grandfather's journal. When I landed on deck, I felt as though I was actuated by, by a new feeling. feeling. The, the familiar, familiar makes, makes which, which were, were uttered, uttered by the crew and the activity of everybody seemed to enliven my spirits. And that homesick feeling gradually fled, for I now felt myself to be under that constraint which often enables a person to overcome difficulties, which by choice would seem impossible. Well, my name's Tom Bastable. I'm from uh, Britain. And uh, I work on Santa Maria as a, as a skipper. Most people want to sail around Cape Horn because it's kind of, it's Cape Horn, man, you know? And it's kind of all about showing how much you are, man, you know? And the idea of doing it because it's a, a continuation of a story when it really kind of appeals to you, man, you know? It seems more, more real, man, you know? And it's not about how manly you are, man, or anything like this, man, you know? It's kind of a, it's a dream, man, you know? Tomorrow, we'll have a look at the forecast, and hopefully, if the weather's okay, we can come down here. And then from Glesa Martial, we wait until the weather's good. And then go and keep on. And now we go back to the Glacier Martial and we come all the way back up. So that's the kind of the rough plan. Outside we have the uh, lab jackets. I clip on the both vocals. I am Axel Dumas. I am from France, from Paris. And now I am working in Santa Maria. When I was 14, I came in a sailing school and uh, I fell in love with sailing. Tu t'en passes pas Ouais, tu me donnes la poche. J'ai des besoins. Tu viens en ce trip avec moi Oui, je suis venu. Tu viens avec moi Oui, c'est bien. Tout bien, man. Oui. Plus de minutes Oui. Plus de minutes. La dernière seconde. La dernière seconde. Ce qui a fait Freddy si intéressant, c'est que son choix de rejoindre la crew était basé seulement sur l'instinct. Et son instinct voulait aller à une aventure. Little did we know that he was with us each step of the way prior to stepping onto the boat. So my name is uh, Freddy. In French, it's uh, Pierre Frédéric von Canel. I'm sailing because uh, I always uh, loved sailing. Uh, when I was younger, I used to sail with my, uh, my uncle uh, on the lake, uh, the different lakes of Switzerland. And then I had some opportunities to, to sail uh, in different places around the world, like on the ocean. And I just, uh, I always loved it. What was ironic, and possibly my great, great, great grandfather sending me a sign, was that when he was on his sailboat in 1858, he too had someone hop onto his boat at the very last second. In fact, it was two boys, and we'd write about them in his journal. Quote, they enjoyed everything that could add to the happiness of youth, and there was nothing to satiate their passion for adventure but a sea voyage. He continued, when I reflect over my, my own past life, life and consider the cause which induced me to go to sea, I have at least the pleasure of saying that it was not the efforts of an overheated imagination. I'll admit, when I left home for the first time, I entertained some wild notions, but the principal cause was excitement. We had our crew. We had our principal cause. Like my great, great, great grandfather, this too was excitement, unlike anything I had ever felt. So they tell us it's Axel and Tom. Okay, they're our captain and first mate. First of all, Tom is the man, Axel. I thought it would be like an old, crusty sailor, seaman, you know? It's this beautiful woman. So right off the bat, any expectations were thrown out the window. When you expect something, it's not what happened at all. And I think he has, he understood that when he came on board. I am not a very big man. I am Axel. How long have you been sailing? Uh, I started to sail when I was 14, and I am 27, so 
Mm. When I am underwater, I imagine my life on, on shore. <laughs> I would like my home in a forest, maybe with a little cove with a little boat to go sailing on the weekend. Maybe I would like to have a, an hostel with a restaurant to have a lot of friends that can come. And uh, yes, my animals. Pig, chickens, ducks. And you're the chef for this boat right now, but you're also a captain too, is that right? On the papers, Tom is the captain because I prefer being inside cooking than be freezing outside. <laughs> She's an amazing cook. She got some real good French cuisine here in the boat. We have two cakes that are ready, I think, now. Yes, they are ready. And what makes you the happiest at sea? Um, the beautiful sunsets, the, the calm waters, the ocean animals, and the sea itself. It's a corn, it's a corn leaf, fresh tomatoes, bread, lettuce, beer, wine. What else can you It's good people. First night on the boat, we were told by our captain and his first mate, the lovely Axel, that they don't get nights like this. That the moon, how it is, with the pink sky, with the dolphins guiding us in the calm seas, doesn't really happen that often. And I kind of like that. I kind of like never been done before. I don't know, man. I mean, everything's coming together on this trip. From dolphins literally jumping out of the water to amazing meals, great company, people that I think understand the story that we're trying to tell. And a finish night one like this? It's magnifique. Finishing it with my new friends tonight. Sunset behind us. I would say here it's not the end of the world, it's the beginning. Okay, so we are in Puerto Toro, which is here. Um, so the idea tomorrow, if it's still good weather, is to come down through here, as you know, the middle, and across this bit. And this bit's the, the worst bit, if you like. This is a big bit of open water. So we see how we are when we get out here, man, how, how windy it is and uh, what the conditions are like. Each night before bed on our adventure, I would reread parts of my great, great, great grandfather's journal. And once again, it was like he was sending subtle messages through his entries. September 7th, 1858. The first night on board passed off without anything happening worthy of remark. The watch is being chosen and set, and according to the old nautical adage which says, the captain takes the ship out, and the mate brings her home. 3 a.m. wake up. I think about working on a boat. The ship's always moving, so it doesn't really matter if you're tired. So Axel, what's going on? I go back to bed. Go back to bed? <laughs> For a few hours, and then I take the read. Just make a tea for Tom. The first morning dawned upon us with all the monotony of a sea life. A light breeze without a sail. Yes, without a speck in sight save that of the sun which was rising in all his splendor about east-northeast. He seemed to look right down upon us as though he was the only person in the whole world to enjoy his light and heat.
So everyone's asleep right now except for uh, Axel. She's uh, driving us, getting us to our next destination. It's uh, almost 10 o'clock now. So got two hours of sleep and up to seven hours. I want to take a quick, quick power nap and get back to it. She calls herself Santa Maria. She's a brunette. Oh, I like to see her. When I go around the Cape, I'm, I'm scared almost the whole trip because I, I know I can get into, into, into any in trouble any time. From uh, bad weather, it would be very calm, and all of a sudden, what well, comes up, what they call Willy Wa, which comes up to about 100 miles an hour very fast, and you could, they could just catch you, off, catch you off guard, and you could be in trouble anytime. So I'm, I'm on my toes the whole trip. Toward the evening of the 19th, the gale increased to a hurricane with heavy rain raised by the terrific force of the wind. It was impossible to tell whether it was rain or spray because the sea ran mountains high. The waves broke over us in such a fearful manner, emerging the ship entirely for 20 to 30 seconds at a time. The clouds were very thick and heavy and appeared to touch the mastheads. They turned day into night and night into darkness. So I just spoke to the control station that came with orders. They said they've got uh, wind speed, I mean wind speed of 65 knots, maybe 87 knots, about 100 miles an hour is going to happen. The worst experience going around the Cape was when the uh, got into a, about a 75 uh, knot gale. And because of the Cape is a very low shallow, the waves pick up like a very like a big uh, triangle. And so your boat goes over about 30 degrees one way and then goes over 30 degrees the other way. So my camera is level right now. He's the one tilted. The whole boat is tilting. Our neighbors in the other boat, they're, uh, looks like their anchor came loose and they're drifting. They're drifting towards us and towards the shore, don't know what's gonna happen. And they pretty much know what we have, like how far away we are and how far we can't go, right? Yeah. No. Well, I hope so, man. <laughs> what did you just say? She said uh, the anchor's good. Our anchor's good. She said, uh, This was an oh shit moment for us, as the waves were clearly blowing in the opposite direction. Tom, our fearless captain, went to check the anchor. And of course, Tyler and Freddie followed, having to see it, having the time of their lives. Young travelers do that, like Ty do it, or Freddie do it, run to the front, get fired up, like, get one that captures you as an explorer, they're, they're not gonna stop. It's a, it's a taste, and once you get it, it's over. For me, it's a totally different feeling on this. It's a real calm sense of being present. I don't know what it is, but I know this gnarly storm is exactly where we're supposed to be, and it's the calmest feeling of all time. Because it's so windy, and that's just not uh, 100% sure. Yeah, we need to do a watch, so maybe like two hours each. 
So it stays a bit. And that way, if the anchor does uh, let go, we know about it really quickly, man, you know, rather than, uh, rather than wake it up half mile that way, man, you know. Water, flat, mirror, flat. It's like glass out there. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, he's sailing. I think you have all you have all the time in the world out here, but look, there was zero pressure on that at all. But just That's getting the sail up. Out. I feel as though uh, there's some pressure. We made it through our first storm, and my mind began to wander. What was William like after his first storm? I can only imagine that he and his crew came together and found a bond, much like the five of us. Truth be told, I almost began to forget about the mission of our journey. Motor's off, and it's just the sails. So much nicer. But you can hear everything. Yeah, you can hear the, the wildlife. It's just us and the nature. And sometimes it's very calm. Sometimes you can't. It's just like calm as a, as a lake, you know, still pond. Uh, so that, and sometimes you're sitting into a nice little calm harbor.
else the rain is gone Somewhere else the time to go And the ocean knows each wave that breaks Is coming home Is coming home Tomorrow morning, sail on Cape Horn Back in the day, they called it Sailor's Graveyard. Probably still call it that today, but yeah, I've been going through this old uh, journal that has inspired this trip. I've talked about it a thousand times. But there was this entry that he wrote in February of 1859, and it's February 2014. I thought it was great. Um, he said, This is another eventful day in our passage. Old Boris, which is the Greek god of winter, uh, never showed himself so more violent, violent than today. today. Save once on the other side of the land. We had all sails set. We were going along at about 10 knots an hour with the yards nearly square when a squall arose, which did not seem threatening. So we took in no sail until it was right upon us. In 30 minutes, we were under close reef top sails, but we never got the sails in until the squall was over, so we made sail again. And at 12 o'clock, our latitude was 33.30 with liberty almost within our grasp. And I, I hope, hope nothing, nothing will happen to snatch life from us like this ever again. Today is the day I get to realize my dream of sailing my great, great, great grandfather's course. And think about being that eight-year-old kid under the covers with the flashlight. And, well, I've never felt more alive. Keep for me. I think what it is, it's Cabo de Olnos, which is like a... Uh... It was a devil, man. But it's not, uh, I'm not sure about it. I mean, that's just kind of my broken Spanish. This, yeah. is the, this is the whole one. Did the fear ever just go away for a moment when you're around on the Cape? And so many people died going around in Cape on shipwrecks. When you're sailing, then you're always ready to have something happen. First time I sailed around Cape on, that was quite calm. It was surprising. I have been scared a few times. You're really nothing in front of the elements. I feel very little in this big ocean, and I love that. As I prepared for this voyage, I learned of an old sailing adage that reads, quote, below 40 degrees latitude, there is no law. Below 50, there is no God. We were right where we wanted to be right where I dreamt of being as a kid, and right where William had been over 150 years ago. What's that right in front of you right there? Cabo de Hornas. Sailor's graveyard, devil's horns, devil's cape, or what we'll call beautiful, I think. You know, Thomas said he hasn't had the sun one time. Well, we've been saying it all along. We've got, a, got another set of hands guiding us, you know? Maybe it's William from 1858. Every time it's very funny because when nobody is throwing up, throwing up, how would you say that? Vomiting. It's not funny at all. So that was good fun. <laughs> Thank you, Yogi. Oh. Like we were connected. While I was throwing up, he was laughing. <laughs> it's like he's been around the whole time, so. I know he was there watching this last one. I think about how many there have been that have come across this, this turn. Made it, didn't. And I'm proud that I got to live out a, a manuscript that got passed down, a story that got passed down, and add another chapter to it. And like we said from day one, whether that story means sailing Cape Horn or whether it's going after that new job or partner or the life, whatever it is you'd like, and we all have a story, we live it however we choose to. It's nice to kind of. Uh, 
to what I'm looking for, man, you know, to, to make people's dreams happen, man, you know, that's nice. We're stamping the passports with the, the Isle of uh, Ila Hornos stamp, man, to prove to you've been very careful. Official. Hey. All right. Hoppa. That was amazing, like, really amazing. It's the first time I see such big waves. I know for them, it's uh, they, they are not big waves, but uh, anyway, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> I had my waves, so it's fine. I'm happy. <laughs> So I, I've never filmed on a boat before. It's hard to take it in, you know, when you're that busy and running around in circles and you don't really just get to sit back and enjoy it as much. But I almost enjoy that just as much as sitting back and enjoying it is the hustle and bustle of capturing the moment. Tyler. Tyler is a weird animal that hides uh, with his cameras, smiling all the time, even if it's between his cameras. Uh, Tyler, man, he's running around like a blue-ass fly, man. Eh? He's always doing so. And I feel a wee bit sorry for him sometimes, man, because he kind of... He hasn't, maybe hasn't got time to sit and watch the world go by, man, because he's always got to try and capture it on film, man, you know. He's good, man. He seems to be good at his job, man. And I like the fact that this is the first time he's been out of uh, the States, man. First time travelling and stuff like that, man. You know? There was some times where I was like, man, I don't know if I can do this. I might just take a return flight home and just bounce. No joke, that crossed my mind, like, twice. And... I can't even believe that I even thought like that at one point. Like, that's just ridiculous. I feel like I've been <laughs> sleeping for too long and taking this nap and trying to find a reason to, you know, not wake up and not go explore and just keep hitting snooze. It's just like, oh, tomorrow. Oh, you know, two months from now. Oh, you know, two years from now. Oh, when, I'm, when I have kids. No, I'm done. Smash that snooze button. It ain't going off anymore. There's no way to hit it. I'm excited. I'm ambitious now, and nothing's gonna hold me back. We should be in for like uh, six o'clock. Yeah. And uh, we should have the wind like this today, so it should be good. So it might be a little bit not northwest, but uh, even still, we should go to seven. How's that going, man? Okay. A lot of chain. Yeah. You try to like keep it organized when it's coming in, and then it just keeps coming. I hope I did a decent job. Freddy's going for a swim. One, two, three. Freddy is becoming a friend. He can play music. He's uh, smiling all the time. Nice guy. Hey, Freddy, man. Freddy's a cool guy, yeah? But he's, uh, just the fact he's traveling by himself, man, you know, and it's not the first time he's been traveling, and he kind of turned up just as we were about to leave, man. You know, really, like, we did all the paperwork, we were just about to take lines off, he turned up, and he's like, oh, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. And then he said it, and he said, OK, let's go for it, man, you know, and I was really, I was really happy for him, man, you know. I mean, I don't pretend to be a sailor, but for, for, for people who like sailing, you need to go to Cape Horn once in your life. It's, it's like, uh, yeah, it's so, so incredible. Are you sad that you'll miss your American friends? Yeah, no, I'm really sad. Like, uh, it, was, it was too cool. It was, it was, uh, yeah, it was great. So I'm really sad that it's already over. At least I will be able to text my girlfriend. So it's, this is the positive uh, point. <laughs> when you're here, you don't think about anything else. You, don't, you leave all your, like, your worries uh, at home. Uh, you have no cell phone here because it's not working anyway. So it's just about living, like the, the true meaning of the verb uh, to live. I wish I could live every day like, like this day. There was a cool connection on this trip. And every morning we had these dolphins that would lead our boat. 
And it was as though, at least for me, that that was like a sign for my great, great, great grandfather that he was along with us. I think the Cape Horn is more than well known all the time. For the sailors, it's the, the dream of all sailors. The, the question now is uh, what's, what's going to be the next one? Because there, there, need, there need to be a next one to keep going further. I think when you're out at sea, you're not, you're not, not so preoccupied about what's going on around, uh, what's going on around in the world, man, you know? You're kind of very egocentric, if you like, man, very self-centered. You know? And I think it kind of it gives you the time to, to think about things. Man. So we finished the trip around Cape Horn with this amazing group of people. Five people from various backgrounds with different stories and it all came together and we shared these really cool moments, you know? And you know, when you look at life, like I think it's easy to talk about you know, big moments, um, but really life just full of moment after moment after moment after moment. None are ever bigger or smaller than the other, just how much you truly maximize each one. And I think that this group, as unique as it was, um, really did that. To quote Monty Python, man, we're all individuals, man, you know? I think that maybe the, the society we live in isn't very good at reminding you of that, man. I think it works on the fact that you, you forget that and become part of the cog in the machine, man, you know? Maybe it's important that as individuals, man, we should all try and remember that, man, you know? And I think that's what this adventure has really been, is uh, me learning how to explore the world on my own. But I did it, you know? And if I can do that, I feel like I can do anything. I think it's just setting me up for, uh, for the future and what I want to do. And I don't know what that is yet, but there's definitely another chapter unfolding right now. I know every end is uh, the beginning of another, uh, another thing, another adventure, and I'm, I'm going on on my, on my trip, so I know I'm going to have uh, other amazing adventures. This part of my life is a little bit of a, a kind of change in time, and you know, and the, the things that I hold dear are changing, man, you know? and the, the things I want are changing. I think. Man. I hope I can come to terms with it, man, you know? because like for me, losing if if I want to do something else, I have to sell my boat, and if I sell my boat, man, that's kind of the end of, of freedom for me, man, you know, or the way I see it. I think maybe I need to change that um, that mindset, man, you know, that, you can be, that perspective. Yeah, you don't need the boat to be free, man, you know. Maybe freedom's inside your head a bit. I could only smile as I walked off that boat and headed home from South America. William knew all along that I would chase this adventure down from the moment I opened his journal as a kid. He knew I was a loner and enjoyed exploring the globe with nothing more than one bag and my own journal. But on this trip, on this sea, and at this stage in my life, William made sure to teach me that while it felt like a solo adventure at first, life's greatest adventures are never done alone. December 19th, 1858. Far, far upon the sea, with the god ship speeding free, as we view the flapping sail swelling out upon the gale, as we watch the wave that glides by the vessel's stately side, we gather in a ring and with cheerful voices sing, not forgetting though we roam, sweet melodies of home. 